In terms of uh, changing workforce models, um, I've covered this off a little bit. I suppose my signal example of just how much the workforce is changing is to invite you to go to Gumtree, the website, and look up next to the second-hand drum kits and cabinets and all the rest of it, disability support worker. And you will find hundreds put, who have already put out their shingle saying, I'm a disability support worker, I've got cert one in, uh, I've got cert one in this, and I've got first aid cert two, and therefore I can provide you with services if you as a participant in the scheme are self-managing and want to engage me. Because you can self-manage in certain circumstances as, as a participant under the scheme. So it's a workforce which I call it a bit, I must confess, I call it a bit um, like the Wild West at the moment, the way the workforce um, um, debate is going. Um, it needs, in our view, to have a great deal more rigour around it in terms of the policy that underpins the development of that workforce. Um, it's not to say that those, those disability support workers advertising on Gumtree and other sites aren't fantastic at their job. It, it is to say that at the moment it's impossible to say that with any confidence at all. And that's a problem when, you're, as I say, you're working with some of the most vulnerable um, um, people in our community with challenging behaviours. Um, we're facing challenges in terms of needing to grow the sector by about 70,000. Um, and in terms of jobs being advertised, perhaps a third of them go unfilled when, when they are advertised. We're facing challenges in terms of not getting enough suitable applicants for the jobs, and that's not a case of providers being choosy. It's a case of providers being sensible as to the sorts of people and their values and behaviours and qualities and qualifications that we want working in our sector. Um, we're facing challenges in terms of the nature of the work. Um, uh, we're seeing short hours, on average about 22 hours per week being offered, often casualised and um, therefore um, producing a small pool of applicants. We're seeing in the allied health sector a shift from full-time to fixed-term roles. So what we're seeing, I suppose, to give you the, the general view, is an increasing instance of precarious employment at a time when the health and human service sector is the fastest growing sector of work employment in Australia. It's estimated to, be, to eventually be bigger than the mining boom itself in terms of employment numbers that it produces. So our challenge, and the challenge for all providers in our sector, is how to create the workforce of the future, the one that wants to stick around and is attracted to and retained by our sector, which can over time see a career path for itself and opportunities to professionalise and the like. Again, that shouldn't be radical in any sector, but it, and I don't suggest it's completely radical in ours, but it certainly represents a challenge. We know when we ask our current work, um, we, we know when, uh, as a result of recent research produced by the Un University of New South Wales, that current staff in the sector are under the pump. They're concerned about their employment conditions, they're concerned about fluctuating pay and in insecure work, they're, con they're concerned because they're increasingly working remotely and unsupervised about the loss of sense of teamwork, physical and mental health risks, which, which, which I alluded to before. Um, they're not sure that, about their levels of job satisfaction and they're frustrated by their inability to provide um, su the support they would want to, in part because of the cap price for services which are currently, currently being paid under the scheme. I'd invite you to have a look at that paper. What I like about that paper is that it wasn't produced by NDS. It was, in fact, um, commissioned by three trade unions, um, which we don't always agree with in every, in, in every respect, um, and that's a, that's a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, constructive, um, a constructive debate. Um, but it nevertheless cited at various points material and research produced by National Disability Services. And it's certainly, um, there's a lot that we found to like about the analysis within that document. In terms of how providers are responding, um, responding to some of these challenges, um, we're fo there's, there's a focus on reducing overheads and indeed the amount of middle management that's present. Um, we still have significant challenges around tran disability transport and ensuring that people with disability get the transport they require to get to where they want to get to when they need it. Um, we're seeing, um, I've already mentioned mergers and acquisitions, we're seeing diversification and some final considerations. We're seeing some providers who are adopting a business as usual approach to the NDIS and others who have been proactive in their approach to the management of risks. Of the two types, I'd have to say I think those who have been proactive are the sensible ones, given the, the, the scale of change the scheme represents. We're seeing, um, uh, this is my experience now, we are definitely seeing an increased capacity, but it was coming off a low base, of boards and directors to understand and assess risks. That's still a journey for many in the sector. 
As I alluded to at the start, I think strategic risk is still an area where many of our boards and board directors um, could stand some serious improvement, but certainly that's gradually coming into the sector. When we're, we're seeing an increased level of understanding amongst providers because of the financial presses, pressures of the cost of providing particular services. And in that regard, we are seeing providers who are making the decision proactively to get out of providing particular services because the costs cannot be met by the price they get for those services, which is an unusual position for profit-for-purpose for profit, um, uh, profit organ organisations to be in. Where, um, yeah, it's certainly an environment in which existing mitigation stra strategies in terms of risk um, may no longer apply because of the changing environment, an environment in which the capacity to undertake risk assessment of existing and new supports, um, uh, I don't say it's increased, I say it's become even more necessary because of the nature of the scheme. Um, we are seeing providers who are exploring new and innovative ways of offering sustainable supports, but nothing like what the agency will in some of its public presentations suggest is happening. I and mean, that's not because ours is a sector that doesn't want to be innovative, it's because the cap price for services makes innovation, well, apart from anything else, it makes the realisation of cash reserves very challenging. And without cash reserves and significant cash flow, then talking in terms of innovation when you're just trying to keep your head above water is a particular challenge. So we are seeing, if you like, the, the seedlings of innovation, but I wouldn't like to kid you that it's just happening ubiquitously across the whole of Australia at the moment. And all of that is likely to create, you'll be unsurprised to learn, new insurance scenarios. 